morning, everyone. Welcome to CSIS. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event today featuring General Jay Raymond, who's commander of U.S. Space Command and commander of Air Force Space Command at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. Uh, we are so lucky to have him joining us for a public conversation with Todd Harrison, who directs our international, excuse me, directs our aerospace security project. I almost gave you my job, aerospace security project here at CSIS. Um, and General Raymond is going to speak first, and then they'll have a moderated conversation followed by audience Q&A. There are very few things that can be considered bipartisan in nature in Washington, but concern over space and space threats are one of those. And so I hope you'll join me in welcoming General Raymond. Thank you, Kath. I greatly appreciate the invitation. And more importantly, uh, thanks for your leadership and wise counsel. I, I always enjoy coming to, to CSIS. And I had to apologize to the CSIS team, because I always get more out of these engagements than I give. Uh, it's a great, uh, and I hope that we'll get to that, that we'll have a really good conversation. And there's some things that I can take away and, and uh, continue to work on. I'll tell you. Uh, about three years ago, just in fact, a little over three years ago, right before I took Air Force Space Command commander, the Air Force Space Command commander job, uh, CSIS held a dinner series. Dr. Hamry hosted a dinner series where we brought folks in um, to talk about the, the challenges in space. And I always marvel. I, I, as I was preparing for these remarks, I marveled at at the at what the folks that were in that dinner would think today, because we have made a ton of progress. I mean, a ton of progress. We have, we have really uh, put the uh, accelerator down and have made some great gains. There's still a ton of work to do. But as I reflected back on those conversations and I look at where we are today with the advances that we've made, there, there's, uh, it's significant. And I think the, the thing that's driving it is one simple sentence. I think there's 11 words in the sentence. Space is a war fighting domain just like air, land, and sea. You know, uh, it used to be you couldn't say that in public. Space and war fighting in the same sentence. The U.S. wants to keep the space domain safe, and, we, and that's still our goal, is to deter any conflict from beginning or extending into space. Uh, but we didn't say that publicly. Now, every speech I give, I say that, and usually right up front. And it rolls off our lips really easily. Uh, but the implications of that are pretty significant. And the implications of that have really been driving my battle rhythm for the last three years um, as we have pretty much changed everything that, that we, on how we operate in Air Force Space Command. And it's driving how we're building and standing up U.S. Space Command. And that's really will be the focus of, of some brief remarks up front. And then I'd really like to get to the, the Q&A and the dialogue. But, um, it's a great opportunity for me to, to talk a little bit about the 11th, the newest command, combatant command, the 11th combatant command in our nation, U.S. Space Command. And U U.S. Space Command is more than just a command focused on space. U.S. Space Command is really helping the department uh, get its arms around global integration. If you look at the national defense strategy and the global challenges that we face, um, we are uh, intimately involved in those conversations. Uh, we're the best in the world at space. And on 29 August, in a ceremony at the White House in the Rose Garden, we got a little bit better because we stood up this command. And this command is singularly focused on the space domain. And that alone provides pretty significant advantage. We come to work every day. It's, my, it's not my tertiary or secondary job. It's my primary job. We come to work every day focused on this domain uh, providing, uh, and providing advantage for our nation. About a year ago, a little over a year ago, in August of last year, um, I was told, hey, I, w there's a potential that we're going to stand up a combatant command and start planning. And so I took five people uh, on a TDY to San Antonio, Texas, locked five people in the room and said, OK, we have to plan this command. And uh, in the evenings, when I got done with the work I was doing on, on that TDY, I was there for another reason. I would huddle with the team and, and review the planning and give direction. And at the end of the week, we came out with, here's how we would build this command if given an opportunity. And it's, it's, a, it's fascinating for me to be given the opportunity to begin planning and then to plan that command and then to stand it up and then to get it going and lead it at its beginning. It's just a great, uh, it's the highlight of my, of my career. We started with those five. 
And we brought that plan back to Peterson and we set up a little tiger team of about 10 people. And we, for the next year, we planned that command. And it's pretty unprecedented if you look at uh, doing all this in one year, from planning to standing up in a year, it's, it's, it's a pretty heroic lift. I'm very proud of that team. Today we're uh, about 400. And here over the next couple months, <laughs> Uh, beginning of next year, I think our numbers will raise up to about 500 in the headquarters. Um, many of you notice, know that we had a U.S. Space Command back in, uh, from 1985 to 2002. And some might say, well, why do we bring it back? Or, or what's different about this command compared to the one that stood down in 2002? As I said in the ceremony that we had at Peterson Air Force Base that recognized the establishment of U.S. Space Command, uh, this is a different command, custom built for a, a, a different day. It's purpose built. It's purpose built to get after the national defense strategy. It's purpose built for the strategic environment that we face today. If you look at the missions uh, that the President signed in the, in the Unified Command Plan uh, and assigned to me as the commander of U.S. Space Command, uh, it has a much uh, sharper focus on protecting and defending satellites and not just not just U.S. satellites, but uh, our U.S. military satellites, its partner or ally commercial uh, satellites. And there's a much sharper focus on offense and defense. Um, probably the biggest thing, one of the biggest things, is it's a, it's a geographic combatant command with an AOR. U.S. Space Command before was a functional combatant command. It didn't have an, an AOR. It provided space uh, capabilities to around the globe. We still do that today, but to strengthen that view that space is a warfighting domain, uh, the department stood up the command with a, as a geographic uh, combatant command, excuse me, with an AOR that's 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface and higher. That's a big AOR, really big AOR. We, we uh, to get after that protect and defend piece, we custom built this command, if you will, and we stood up a joint task force for space defense. It's the first time we've had an operational level component focused on that protect and defend mission. Uh, and so that's uh, been very, very helpful. As we, as we are a geographic combatant command, we are planning to have integrated planning elements that will embed in all the other combatant commands to help us uh, stay connected with those, with those commands. Again, that's purpose built because the, the challenges that we face and that we'll face in the future are gonna be global challenges. That's gonna require all combatant commands uh, working together. We have a stronger connection with our allied partners. We've made great, great strides in that over the last few years. And I'm really proud of, of where, we, where we are. When we stood up the command, we, again, purpose-built a combined Space Force component. Uh, before, I was the commander of a, of a Joint Force Space Component Command that was part of STRATCOM. When we stood this up, we made it a combined command. We're operating off the same order operate in uh, the same C2 centers, and that's going to provide huge advantage to, to the folks that are, are to for us and our partners. We'll also have, we'll get additional authorities. Uh, space Policy Directive 4 mandated the department come back with what authorities does U.S. Space Command need to do those missions. So we've put those together, and I'm uh, very hopeful that those will be uh, approved here in the, in the very near term. Um, again, ties to our partners. There's several partners that I'd like to I'd like to focus on. One is our joint warfighting partners. As uh, again, as our national defense strategy states, uh, the challenges that we're going to face in the future are going to be global challenges. A, a challenge in the Pacific is not just Indo-PACOM. That's going to require all the combatant commands uh, together to be able to handle those challenges. For example, uh, I'm convinced that in the future, if we were to get into a conflict with a peer or near peer competitor. We're going to have to fight for space superiority. That's a joint warfighting challenge. That's a joint warfighting challenge that's going to require other combatant commands to be supportive of me in, in, our, in our U.S. Space Command hat. Um, our partnership with our allies I've talked about. We have, over the last several years, increased the training opportunities with our allies. We have uh, exercised with our allies. We do war games with our allies. We've, we've stood up a combined space operations center. We turned that from a JSPOC to a CSPOC. We now turn the Joint Force Space Component Command into a Combined Space Force Component Command. Uh, so I'd see great, great benefit. We, we're uh, doing hosted payloads uh, with, with allied partners. 
uh, like Japan, uh, and putting a hosted payload on on a QZSS satellite. We're doing hosted payload uh, partnership with with uh, uh, Norway as well, as examples. We also have a closer relationship with the interagency. Our in, our relationship with intelligence. Uh, uh, community has never been better. Our relationship between us and the NRO is is at an all-time high. Uh, we we have a, uh, a standard, uh, a shared strategy, a shared concept of operations. Uh, we man a C2 center called the the National Space Defense Center. I'll tell you in speeches that I've given over the last couple of years, I said you know we've gone from like preschool to about fifth grade. I just spent a handful of hours. Uh, out at the NSDC a week or so ago, and I will tell you, I'm, I'm changing that. We're in high school. We've made some really, really, really significant gains based on the data sharing that, that uh, we're able to do, based on um, having situational awareness tools. Uh, it, it, we've really made some, some great, great strides. Um, and our partnerships with commercial industry, and I see this as a, a big growth area going forward. Um, we have a, a commercial integration cell on the floor at the Combined Space uh, uh, Operations Center. I see great, uh, uh, great uh, steps ahead in being able to leverage this. Uh, and I, I talk about this, I say this in speeches too, kind of a bad term to use in the space business, but this explosion in commercial space. I think there's, there's great opportunities uh, uh, ahead. So as we built this command, again, we're, we, we built it to meet the national defense strategy. Uh, and if you look at the, if you look at the national defense strategy, and you look at the priorities of the nas national defense strategy, rebuilding the readiness, strengthening alliances and new partners, and reforming the department, uh, those are all things that that U.S. Space Command uh, ties into. Um, our priorities for the command are five. We've laid out five priorities. First, um, we're going to transition space warfighting responsibilities from U.S. Strategic Command to U.S. Space Command in in full. And we've done that, we did that starting on 29 August. And so we're responsible for space operations. We do that day to day. And I'll tell you, not only have we not missed a beat, we've actually uh, enhanced the game a little bit. Uh, we're leading this to, to uh, going to full operational capability. And we're moving out with a sense of urgency to be able to do that. So if we're already doing operations, what are the other things that we're, we're working on? Requirements. Uh, a component doesn't have, re have a requirement function. A combatant command does. So we're building out a requirements team. Uh, intelligence. Uh, I will tell you the uh, maybe one of the the most important things that we do early on is to rebuild that intelligence function that that uh, atrophied uh, once the, uh, the U.S. Space Command that stood down in 2002 went away. I think the most significant thing, thing in our highest priority action is planning, and and not just planning uh, by ourselves, but planning in concert with. Um, with uh, the combatant commands around the world that we partner with. Uh, and that's why the, the, uh, we're building these integrated planning elements to embed with the other combatant commands. The other priority is to expand key allied and commercial partnerships that I talked about. And the last one that I haven't mentioned so far is growing space warfighters. And that's a two-part problem. That's growing space operators that understand joint warfighting, and it's, and it's uh, building what you and I might consider more traditional joint warfighters that have a better understanding of space. So what's our progress to date? Well, we've gone from about five people to about 500. And so we're building that team. And, and I'm really proud of how, how we've uh, brought this team together uh, and, and gotten them moving really, really quickly. Uh, we've gone through a, a joint manpower validation process to figure out what the command is going to look like at the end. That's complete. We've hired integrated planning element leads, and we're going to stand up the first integrated planning elements both at Indopaycom, uh, UCOM, and STRATCOM. And we're working very closely with NORTHCOM as well. We've reached out to other combatant commands, took a uh, visit with AFRICOM. Uh, so we're very linked in with U.S. Strategic Command, as you can imagine, uh, NORTHCOM, Indopaycom, uh, UCOM, and, and now AFRICOM, and uh, really uh, appreciate that engagement. Um, we're we're embedded in the global integrating piece of the department. So we're playing in war games and exercises uh, as part of that. And, and I think not only we're we playing in it, but we're helping leading that effort uh, for the department. We've enhanced our engagements with our allies. I went over and, and briefed the military committee at NATO to try to get a more formal uh, relationship going with NATO. NATO is about to declare uh, space as an operational domain. And I think that's going to be very important that we have that 
that linkage. Um, uh, we're on the planning side. We've de we're developing the campaign plan for space. That'll be done here uh, at the beginning of next year. We've published our first integrated priority list, so we're beginning to have much more of a of a uh, influence on the on the budget, if you will. Uh, and that's again a, a much strength and much more heightened voice at a combatant command level than than we were at a component level. Um, the list goes on and on, but you can kind of get a sense for, for where, we're, where we're headed. Um, we're ready now, and we're growing stronger each and every day. We're in line with the direction from the National Defense Strategy. We're building a fighting force to respond to the competitive, congested, and contested strategic environment that we face today. And we have a great opportunity, as I tell our team, that we're not wedded to the past. We're starting kind of from scratch, and so we can build this command in a way uh, that gets after the, the uh, challenges that we face. With that, I think I'll close and open it up for a dialogue. I really, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm extremely, extremely proud of the airmen, sailors, soldiers, Marines uh, that, that I'm privileged to lead in U.S. Space Command. I couldn't be proud, more proud of how quickly uh, they've come up on the step uh, and provided advantage to our nation, and not just our nation, but to our allied partners as well. I'd like to, I was remiss, I'd like to take a minute and introduce Chief Toberman. Chief Toberman is our senior enlisted advisor for, uh, for the command as well, and he's here with me. So again, thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to the dialogue. Well, General Raymond, yeah, I want to just say thank you again for coming here to CSIS uh, to share your thoughts uh, on the future of the United States Space Command. I wanted to start with kind of a, a basic definitional question because I was telling a friend earlier, you know, what I was going to be doing Monday morning, uh, you know, uh, doing this event with the commander of the United States Space Command, and uh, and she asked me, well, you know, what was his job before that? Because you know, it's a new command, and I said, well, you know, he's the commander of Air Force Space Command, and then of course the you know, question was, what's the difference? Um, so you know, just can you help define for folks? You know, what are the roles and responsibilities of Air Force Space Command and United States Space Command? How are they different and how they function? Uh, sure, well, that's a, great, that's a great question and one I get quite frequently. And not only did I get a new job, I kept my old job as well, so I get to do both. <laughs> and I get to yell at myself in one hat and I've gotten an opportunity to do that over the last couple of weeks. Like, how can you be so stupid? And, uh, <laughs> uh, it's kind of fun to have that conversation. Um, the, back in the 80s, there, were, there was a law that was done called the Goldwater Nichols Act. And the Goldwater Nichols Act uh, divided the department kind of into two functions. One is an organized train and equip function, and one is a warfighting function. Services do organized train and equip, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. And, and uh, in my Air Force Space Command hat, I am in the organized train and equip business. We procure satellites, we train operators, we have uh, uh, the C2 capabilities to be able to, to conduct those operations. Uh, uh, but we, that's focused on organized training equipment. I, in that hat, I work for uh, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force and the Secretary of the Air Force. In a joint hat, in the, in the warfighting hat, that's joint business. And so U.S. Space Command falls on the warfighting side. So it's analogous to UCOM, Indo-PACOM, NORTHCOM, STRATCOM. We now have a U.S. Space Command that is warfighting focused. So it's a completely different function. In my Air Force hat, I organize, train, and equip Air Force forces, and I present them to myself in my U.S. Space Command hat to be able to execute. I also will have an Army, and that's called a service component. I'm a Air Force Space Command is a service component to U.S. Space Command. I'll also have an Army service component. We'll have a Navy service component, a Marine service component. And so uh, it's two different functions, two different roles, uh, but there's a, a close partnership. Well, so then, you know, thinking ahead to the future, one of the things Congress is still debating and considering is whether or not to create a space force. So can you talk about how a space force would be different? Absolutely. And let me state, I'm, I'm really eager for Congress to, to pass this uh, NDAA so we can have a space force. Uh, in both hats, in, in both functions, uh, the organized training and equip function and the warfighting function, the U.S. is looking to elevate space. To have, to have an entity that's singular, singularly focused on the space domain. And so in the warfighting hat, we did that when we took a component command that used to work for U.S. Strategic Command and elevated that to its own combatant command. 
Similarly, on the organized train and equip side, uh, today Air Force Space Command is a, um, a major command working for the Air Force. What we're looking to do is to elevate space and separate it from the Air Force and have a, have a singularly focused service focused on this domain. And the way uh, uh, it's envisioned is it's very similar to the Navy Marine Corps model. You have a secretary of the Air Force uh, that would have both a chief of staff of a space force, or however the law comes out, and a chief of staff of the Air Force that would work for the secretary of the Air Force. Just like on the, on the uh, Navy side, there's a secretary of the Navy that has a commandant of the Marine Corps and a, and a chief of naval operations uh, on, the, on the Navy side. So it would be analogous to that. And, and, and so, you know, U.S. Space Command, putting on that hat um, for a minute, you know, you mentioned in your remarks how it, it was, it's different this time. We used to have U.S. Space Command. It was a functional command. Now it's been reestablished as a geographic command. Uh, one of the roles of the geographic commands is that they put together operational plans within their area of responsibility. So CENTCOM will have operational plans, you know, for contingencies that might arise in the Middle East, UCOM, you know, will be responsible for Europe, uh, Indo-PACOM for the Pacific region, and so on. Uh, is U.S. Space Command developing operational plans that are exclusively for the space domain? Yeah, absolutely. And so, that, that, as I mentioned in my remarks, that's probably the highest priority, our highest priority activity to do. Uh, we've started with building the campaign plan first. Uh, we've made great progress on that. Uh, again, early next year, that, that should be done. Uh, and then, uh, as we build our planning team, uh, we're, we're beginning the work on, uh, on doing the OPLAN development. The, the thing that we're going to work really hard to do is to do that development in concert with the other combatant commands. And that's why those integrated planning elements are so important. They're going to be, those integrated planning elements will live in those other combatant commands and will help us plan together. There's, if you look at the, again, if you look at the challenges that we're going to face in the future, they're global challenges. And the, the need to be interconnected between combatant commands is, is, is very, very important. And uh, we're going to build these plans in partnership with the other combatant commands that we largely support, but they will also be supporting to us. Yeah, so I want to talk about kind of those organizational seams, if you will. And we already have this uh, with the other geographic commands and, you know, a, a, you know a, a, an O plan that might deal with uh, Russia incursion in Europe could also have impacts. You know, Russia may do things uh, in the Pacific region at the same time. So we already have some seams uh, between these uh, different AORs. Um, can you talk about a little more detail? How are you working the seams between you know, U.S. Space Command 100 kilometers above and all the other geographic commands that are 100 kilometers and below, you know, especially when you know, there might be a war fighting scenario where someone launches a missile, it goes above 100 kilometers, but it's going to come back down below 100 kilometers, or as part of a, a contingency of one of the you know, uh, one of the other theaters, um, you know, it, as part of what's going on, on the ground, uh, another nation may choose to attack our assets in space. Who, how do you integrate those plans and who's in charge operationally if we get into a war fighting situation that starts on Earth but extends into space? Yeah, so um, one of the, I mentioned in my remarks, if you look at the national defense strategy, it talks about global challenges. And, and it, the, the joint staff has really been pushing under uh, 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 the former chairman's leadership and now with, with General Milley, uh, really focusing on global integrating, uh, global integration and, and, and having a, glo a globally integrated plan that, that addresses those themes. Because as I, as I mentioned, if there's a conflict in one part of the world, uh, it's not just going to be the combatant command for that part of the world. It's going to it's going to bleed over. So, for example, in the scenario that you laid out, if there's a conflict with Russia, if deterrence were to fail, and there's a conflict with Russia, uh, that would require UCOM, obviously, as the as the primary combatant command focused on that region. It will also uh, require the support from U.S. Space Command. It will require the support from U.S. Transcom, it'll require the support from U.S. Northcom, U.S. Strategic Command, U.S. Cyber Command, and you can just see how uh, those plans have to be integrated so those uh, so we don't have those things. 
Um, and if you plan together and do that work together, uh, we think there's, uh, it'll provide great benefit. So in most situations you envision U.S. Space Command would be a supporting command rather than a supported command? In most cases we would, but there are, there are uh, the inverse holds true as well. As we, in the future, uh, as we have to fight for space superiority, we are going to require support from other combatant commands as well to conduct those missions. All right. And you mentioned deterrence. Um, can you talk a little bit about how do you think about uh, deterrence uh, and in your job and the, the space component of right. deterrence? A lot of people ask me about space deterrence. And I, my view is there is no such thing as space deterrence. It's just deterrence. And traditionally, we have thought about deterrence <laughs> with our nuclear forces. Uh, but I think. Uh, Deterrence is much broader than that. I think there's things that we can do in space to amplify that deterrence message um, along with others. And so as, as we look at global, uh, global integrators, if you will, I think we also need to look at who's the integrator for deterrence because um, uh, each combatant command has a deterrent role and, and we need to make sure that, that we're that working together we are, we are sending a coordinated deterrence message because our primary goal and our primary mission, if you look at, I should have said this in my remarks, if you look at U.S. Space Command, our mission set really is, we call it the four Ds. First is deterrence. Uh, we do not want to get into a conflict that begins or extends into space. And so there are things that we can do to, to change that, the calculus of a potential adversary uh, to deter. And, and again, doing that in concert with the other combatant commands. The second area that we're, we're focused on is to, um, is to defend. I talked about there's a, a sharper focus on protection, protecting and defending uh, the space domain. So that's the second D. The third D is what we've been really good at for years, and that's to deliver. We, we deliver capabilities to the Joint and Coalition Warfight. We do that uh, you know, largely since Desert Storm. We've been focused on that. Uh, and the, the fourth D I mentioned in my remarks is to develop uh, those joint warfighters. So deter is number one, defend, deliver, and develop are the four Ds uh, for the command. Oh, and so I would note in those priorities, um, you know, you're not talking about any kind of aggressive offensive actions in space. I think, you know, uh, there have been a lot of you know, discussions among folks outside of the military and especially in international forums worrying uh, that the reestablishment of United States Space Command and the creation of a space force is somehow signaling that the U.S. is taking a more aggressive offensive posture in space. How would you res respond uh, to those critics? Well, I think, you know, our mission state is clear. I mean, we're, we're, we are a warfighting command and any warfighting command, uh, and if you look at the mission statement, it says U.S. Space Command will conduct offensive and defensive operations. I, as I said up front, our goal is to deter that from happening. And the way you do that is to deter from a position of strength. That's the best way I know how to do it. Uh, but that's our primary focus. We do not uh, want to enter into a conflict that begins or extends into space. Our focus is making sure that we do so from a position of strength and that we have the ability to protect and defend those capabilities that fuel not only our American way of life, but fuel our American way of war. Now, uh, before we go to questions from the audience, um, so you, you guys can start getting your questions ready, um, I have family uh, down in Alabama, uh, and every now and then they, uh, they send me articles uh, about how, you know, U.S. Space Command, they're trying to pick a headquarters now. I don't expect that you're ready to make an announcement right now, um, but feel free if you are. <laughs> but, What's the process that goes into figuring out, you know, where you're going to put the permanent headquarters of U.S. Space Command? Yeah, so there's a, a basing process. The Air Force has been named the, the, uh, the lead for that process, uh, and the Air Force is running, running that process. We, uh, it's a very transparent process. Uh, it's used for, for all the decisions, not just U.S. Space Command, but for all the basing decisions that the, that the Air Force makes, and there's a... Uh, a list of candidate bases. Those bases are, are fully vetted and analyzed to be able to support the missions of that command and then uh, the Air Force Secretary then makes that, makes that decision. So we're in that process uh, and, and it's underway. Any, any idea about when that process might I, be completed? I don't, okay. I don't have any idea. I'd, we'll ask the Air Force Secretary. Yeah, <laughs> I hope, uh, 
She's, they're, they're running that process. All right. Uh, all right, so I want to open it up here for questions from the audience. Um, all right, let's see here. Sandra, I'm going to go to you first. How are you? Here, wait for the microphone. Yes. Uh, good morning, General. Sandra Irwin, Space News. Uh, I wanted to ask you about an initiative from Air Force Space Command that we heard. Uh, you hosted a meeting with agencies to talk about the future of space ranges and, and launch facilities. Uh, you, want, you have a vision for some sort of national space sport. Can, can you give us some details of what you have in mind, what's going to be happening uh, on that issue? Thank you. Sure. I, you know, I, one of the areas I think we have great opportunity, uh, um, this is on my Air Force Space Command hat side. Uh, one of the things that we've been working is to take advantage of uh, where commercial industry is heading. Our ranges today are, are uh, large ranges with lots of infrastructure, um, both on the East Coast and the West Coast. If you look at where commercial industry is heading, uh, commercial industry is heading towards autonomous ranges. And so today, for example, SpaceX, when they launch a rocket, uh, they don't use our radars, they don't use our telemetry, they don't use what we call command destruct antennas, which, which we have. Uh, antennas that with people on console that if a, if a missile were to start going astray, they would send a, uh, a signal to the rocket to blow it up. They do it all, it's all autonomous. That saves a significant amount of dollars and, and saves uh, and allows for a, a more rapid turnaround of the range uh, and, and a more resilient range in my, in, in my perspective. So uh, this, this, what we're calling range of the future, is all based on how do we position ourselves to get after the, the warfighting requirements that we're going to need from a joint capability, and that's to be able to have assured access to space to do it uh, cheap, uh, with less cost and, and uh, a faster turnaround time. And so we're working this with uh, collaboratively with the commercial industry, with all of the range partners, um, and we're just <coughs> furthering that dialogue uh, to see uh, how we can transform those ranges to best support the total population that uses them. Do you, do you need more money to do that? Uh, I'm hoping to do this with less money. I, you know, today our ranges are really significant. I mean, there are lots of, lots of infrastructure. Um, uh, with autonomy, you, you get to reduce uh, some of that infrastructure, which I think will be, which will be very important and would also be a cost savings as well. All right, question over here. Thanks, Todd. Uh, good morning, sir. Kurt Hackmeyer from Northrop Grumman. My question, sir, is um, it seems like you're the single focal point for everything space. Um, <laughs> and so with that, um, there are requirements, CDDs that are being developed. You talked about accelerating. You also talked about starting with a clean sheet. From, in, from, starting what? from a clean sheet. You right, said at the right, end you're, right. you basically have a clean sheet. From industry's perspective, we're trying to understand where that direction is going and what the priorities are. Mm -hmm. How are you looking at the uh, requirements, the CDDs, that are coming out, and then balancing that with the programs that are already being developed and those things that you need in the future to satisfy what, what you're being told you need? Yeah, so a couple of things. First of all, um, I uh, I've been, I've tried to be as transparent as I can be with industry. I, one of my friends told me, he, uh, all my old friends have all retired uh, from, from the military, uh, and they've all, all told me, you don't understand just how hard industry tries and to, to understand what's in your head. I said, well, they don't need to try that. I'll just tell them. I'll tell them. I don't want you to spend a dime trying to figure out what I'm thinking. I, I need you to, to help me, help us get to where we need to go. Uh, and so uh, we have a concept of operations on how we're going to operate. And I invited industry to come in and say, okay, look, we're going to give it to you. The problem was it was so classified that very few could come in. And so we're working very hard to reduce the, the classification on issues to allow uh, a, a uh, more conversation back and forth. I, I think if you look at the requirements going forward, it's not it's not good enough just to be able to get a satellite in orbit and have an exquisite satellite that provides exquisite capability. You have to also be able to protect and defend it, and it has to be defendable. And so uh, balancing that, uh, uh, the mission cost and, and being able to defend it are all things that, that we're looking at 
uh, in, our, in our requirements. Most. As a combatant command, you have a stronger voice in, in joint requirements. And um, I think that's going to be very helpful for the space, space community. Can I just say one thing? Sure. Wait for the, the microphone here. As loud as we can be in this room, it just somehow doesn't make it out into the internet. Thank, thanks, sir. <laughs> um, understanding that, sir, when the requirements come out of the combatant commands and they go to the acquisition agency, they then come out as requirements that we in industry respond to. Those two don't align, sir. They, the requirements that we're responding to as industry and the expectation that you have as a combatant commander, they don't align. And so that's a challenge, sir, that we in industry, we want to give you the capability that you need, but the folks who are writing the requirements, the section well, outs, it's the kind of interesting because in my two hats, I have a foot in both of those camps, so they better align. <laughs> because if not, I'm not aligned with myself on the Air Force side. They don't yet, sir. So, so then let's have a conversation and we'll work to bring that into alignment. If it's not, I, I, from what I can tell, um, I think the alignment is, is, I think we're getting much better at alignment. I think elevating, re-standing up U.S. Space Command and uh, as a combatant command is, is going to even help that further. So I'd love to have that conversation with you. All right. So you have a question up front here? Yes, ma'am. Hello, sir. I'm uh, Shirley Ross from the RAND Corporation. Yes. Um, as we transition to more of a warfighting focus in space, um, can you kind of go down a level and um, address what human capabilities you think our service members will need to have that perhaps they do not have now? Yeah, so uh, let me just answer it this way. Um, I, I give a, a talk, and the, the talk that I give, I've given it to in the process of giving it to every airman and Air Force Space Command, and that's trying to drive a, a, a war fighting culture. And the way I describe it, I have a PowerPoint slide, uh, and half of the slide is a picture of Sully Sullenberg. Yeah, every, everybody knows Sully Sullenberg. I mean, he was the, the pilot that, uh, when the birds got ingested and the, the engines uh, safely landed the plane on the Hudson River, everybody survived. Spectacular pilot, absolutely spectacular pilot. If I was on an airplane, I would want Sully to be my pilot, because I know I might get a little wet, but I'm gonna live, <laughs> right? I mean, he's spectacular. <clears throat> On the other half of the chart is a fighter pilot. Equally spectacular pilot, but operates in a different domain. Somebody's shooting at the fighter pilot. Nobody's shooting at, at whatever airline uh, Sully was flying for. It requires a different set of training. And so what we have done, because we've had the luxury of it, is we have grown up building Sully's. We have, we have the world's best space operators. And if you want somebody to operate the space capability, you want United States Airmen, Sailors, Soldiers, Marines to do that because we're, we're world-class trained at that. We now have to shift that to a fighter pilot method mentality, have a better understanding of, of the threats, having a better understanding of how to operate your capabilities through those threats, uh, having a better uh, understanding of, of uh, uh, potential adversaries, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different way of doing business. And so we have completely transformed how we go about developing our operators. We've revamped our schoolhouse over the last year and a half or so, now taught uh, at a different classification level with threats from day one, they, get, they start learning this. Uh, we have um, uh, revamped our, our professional development courses in Space 100, 200, what we call Space 100, 200, and 300. Uh, to get more after this do uh, domain. We have, uh, we have recategorized our operators into four distinct mission areas to give them greater depth. So we've completely transformed how we do business, but it's to get after that, as you mentioned, that shift from a benign domain to a warfighting domain. And the best analogy I can use is the Sully versus a fighter pilot. Yes, sir. Morning, sir. Gil Klinger from hey, Raytheon. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Um, two questions for you. You're only allowed one. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I take your point completely. It's not deterrence in space. It's deterrence as applied to space. But there's an entire uh, intellectual foundation in, for example, nuclear deterrence that simply doesn't exist with respect to space. And so, as you know, over the years, 
technology and the threat have paced the policy community. You've now staked out, the United States has now staked out a frontier that to many sounds very aggressive. And it probably sounds all the more aggressive because we've been silent about space entirely for so long. So in as much as the credibility of, of deterrence anywhere depends on having capability, in part depends on capability one can point to, you don't have much you can point to. Jammers, everything else is behind 27 doors. And, and at some point there's gonna have to be an impedance match between those two but the DNA of the space community is almost 180 degrees away from that. So I'd, I'd be struck, interested in your comments on that. And my second question is really related to that. Last time I checked, there aren't a lot of planners at the NRO. It's also not in their DNA. So can you speak to the same transition you're making with respect to the COCOMs, turning joint warfighters into space smart folks and space warfighters into joint smart can you talk to that with respect to the NRO? Uh, sure. Um, uh, on the first question that had like 10 questions as part of it, <laughs> he, actually asked like, he actually asked like 16 questions on that too. Uh, on, the, on the first part, I would just say, uh, again, our number one priority is to, to, to deter. I agree with your premise that to deter, you have to change the calculus. You have to either impose costs or deny benefits. And to do that, and I think that's, that, calculus is foundational to whatever deterrence. That's, that's the, the foundation of deterrence. I agree with you to do that, you have to, uh, there's a messaging part of that. And so one of the things that we're working on is to develop that strategy on what we will talk about and what we won't talk about. So that work is un underway as we speak. Um, on the second part of your question, we have a really strong partnership with the, with the NRO. Uh, the NRO largely does their mission set. We largely do our mission set. Uh, but where we come together is on protecting and defending. And we have, uh, uh, we stood up a National Space Defense Center, which is manned by both uh, uh, organizations. Um, and we're planning together. We're, we, again, we, we've built the CONOPS together. We've actually now not only have the strategy, the CONOPS, the organizations that are jointly manned, we now are actually doing uh, programs together. And we, I canceled a program that we were doing on space situational awareness because it wasn't going to meet our mission needs and we partnered with the, with the NRO. Uh, we have something called, um, uh, it's an acronym, uh, Joint Space Warfighting Forum that's chaired by myself and the director of the NRO where we get together uh, very frequently and talk about those warfighting challenges. So um, I, I think they're uh, coming along right with us and I, I think the alignment's really, really close. I think Tony had his hand up yeah, here at the back. Hi, sir. Uh, Tony Capacio yeah, with Bloomberg sorry. News. The national intelligence uh, community is updating the NIE on space threats from China and Russia. Do you expect the conclusions to show exponential or major advances in the, their capabilities or more incremental based on what we know? And second, what mechanism do you have for taking those types of threat findings and incorporating them into acquisition pro requirements and programs, like for GPS-3, SDA's constellation, and the uh, overhead uh, infrared constellation you're planning? Yeah, I, I won't speculate on what a, a report that's going to come out might say. Uh, I can tell you, from my perspective, the scope, scale, and complexity of that threat is, is alive and well and very concerning. Uh, on the how do you, how do you, uh, how do we take uh, information from those uh, uh, assessments and get those into programming. It, it gets back to the conversation that we talked to earlier. Uh, it is no longer good enough to think that you can build a satellite that just has to survive the launch and survive what we call infant mortality, you know, that it comes off the launch vehicle and it operates when it first gets, first gets to space. Uh, you, now have to, uh, you now have to be able to survive in a, an environment that's contested. And so we build those, uh, um, we, take, we take things from that assessment and then build those into future satellite programs to make sure that we can uh, protect and defend those. Our, our joint force and coalition partners rely on those space capabilities. Every U.S. citizen uh, relies on those space capabilities and, and our job is to make sure that, that uh, they're always there for us. 
Can I ask a related question? Sure. Uh, you know, you see a lot of the uh, commercial space companies now are talking about <laughs> building large, what we call proliferated constellations of satellites. Many of them are small satellites, but fielded in quantities of hundreds or thousands. Um, you know, how do you think the military can utilize those kind of capabilities that are being fielded commercially, and how can that help contribute uh, to countering the threats that we're seeing and helping to deter adversaries? Yeah, so, um, uh, first of all, there, there is, it's, it's beginning, you, you saw, um, back, I think it was April, SpaceX launched their first 60 satellites of Starlink just a week or so ago. They launched their second batch of 60, so you're already seeing this growth today. Of all the satellites that we track, the numbers are, don't quote me on this, it's in the, in the order of 1,500 to 1,600 objects in space that are satellites. The rest is debris of the high 20,000s, the things that we track, very small numbers of satellites, that's gonna change. That's changing significantly uh, if these materialize. Uh, uh, we do think, I think the biggest thing, we talked a little bit about this earlier. One of my former jobs, I worked in an office called the Office of Force Transformation uh, back with a gentleman named Admiral Zabrowski when he was alive. And one of the things, that the project that I was given at the time was to try to develop a new business model for space. And that's to, to uh, you know, build the, the challenge that I was given was build a satellite uh, and launch it uh, and operate it for a year for about $10 million. Uh, it was called TaxAt1. It was to try to change that business model. And, and I think the thing that this, besides the fact of proliferated, a proliferated architecture with large numbers of, of, of satellites uh, and what that might do for the protection and defending piece. I think what it really does, though, is change the business model for space and allows you to change the risk calculus. And so um, if today, if we were to build a satellite, and we know it's going to take a significant number of years, we put a lot of mission assurance into it because you know, the national security of the United States rests on it, and we need to make sure it's, it works. Well, if, and, we, and we know if it doesn't work, it's going to take another bunch of years to, to get another one. If you know that, well, the next one's coming off the assembly line in a week from now, it changes that calculus. And I think allow us to move with a little bit more agility. And I think what you're going to see is uh, uh, kind of a hybrid approach. Because uh, you also have to have those really good uh, uh, capabilities. But I think there's also a layer of operationally good enough capabilities that can really make a difference and change that business model, which I think is so important to do. This gentleman back here has his hand up. Thank you. Jose Ocasio, Christian, Kalis Partners. Other combatant commands, AFRICOM, Cyber Command, had an industrial base that could support them fairly quickly. Yes, the new IPOs came in. Do I'm you sorry, see so the new what came in? As, as an IPO came in, as requirements came from that command. Right. Do you, we see it a little different that your command will have new innovation that is coming through as a result of your new war fighting domain. How do you see industry you know, now that you just finished talking about that transformation, how long and how do you see the hybrid happening in order to support uh, these future requirements? Well, um, yeah, well, I think you see it beginning to happen now. I mean, there's, um, again, I, not the, the explosion of, of companies building uh, these capabilities, I think, I think are gonna be uh, very helpful to us. I, I think that, the reduction, I think there's two things that have happened. Launch costs have gone down, and technology has allowed smaller satellites to be more operationally relevant. And those two factors of reduced launch costs and, and now uh, uh, operationally relevant small satellites are going to really uh, provide us an opportunity to, to leverage those going forward. And I think it's coming. The challenge, though, is that that industrial base is a lot smaller than the other ground base or air base. Just something I think we should look yeah, at. Yeah, and I, I think the industrial base, though, expands, right? Because uh, <coughs> other companies that, that you know, non-traditional companies yeah. now have an ability to get into this, into this market. Cause, and so I think I, I'm pretty excited about where this is going. I, I think you also have to have a bridging strategy. You, you, just, can't, you just can't say uh, to the United States, we're going to turn off GPS for the next five years and wait till we get to the next thing. You have to bridge, and so we're working that strategy as well. So, from a from an industry 
there's that gap, but from a finance, that bridging strategy is it's a mean system. Well, we're, that's I, a challenge. Yeah, I, I would push back a little bit. I, we're, we're, uh, we're making some progress on that front. Right, I want a, a question over here in the front. Thank you very much, General. My name is Andrea Rotter. I'm a researcher with a German think tank, um, affiliated with the governing conservative party. And I would like to draw the attention to the, well, U the US engagement with NATO and European yes. allies. Um, you mentioned NATO possibly declaring it an operational domain, as well as national pro space programs, Norway or space. But still, when I see the debate in Europe, and especially in Germany, it's that we are still lacking the sense of urgency. So when we discuss space, it's more or less under commercial considerations. So my question for you would be, what are the main obstacles for transatlantic cooperation in this field? Is it the technological gaps? Is it the lack of awareness? And what would you like us Europeans to do more in this respect? Thank you. Yeah, so we, we are, as I mentioned, we are working really hard to develop partnerships in the space business. Um, we haven't. We haven't really needed them in the past. Space was a benign domain. It you didn't. It weren't that as important. It's really critical today, and so we're working very closely uh, with our Five Eyes partners, plus uh, your country, uh, France, Japan, and others. We hope to attract others. Um, I th I think there's just there's an awareness issue, and I that you know the average person in the world, I don't think understands just how linked how how their way of life is linked to space. Uh, it, it, it really fuels our collective ways of life. And I don't think the, the average person understands that. I don't think the average person understands the, the, the threat that exists today. And so uh, I really believe we're at this critical inflection point. And in, in, um, I've been very, uh, we've got great partnership with your country. They participate in in exercises with us, they participate in war games with us. Um, I really would like to uh, get these partnerships to be more than just data sharing partnerships and really move towards mission, sh mission sharing. Uh, so for example, uh, well, I talked about hosted payloads on, on satellites. And we have other satellites that feed information into our situational awareness catalog. Um, uh, and I think there's other, there's other, we have partnerships in our, in, uh, communications uh, systems. So I, I think there's great opportunity here uh, to develop uh, capabilities uh, that will be mutually beneficial for, for all of our countries. And primarily, it gets back to the 16-part question that Gil asked me on deterrence. <laughs> and it, it's, you know, we're stronger together. And if you want to deter from a position of strength, I mean, that's, that's been the core of NATO, right, is to deter that. And so I really believe it gets to that foundation as well. All right, so I see we are basically yeah, out of time here. I want to ask one final sure. question. I know that this has really been a burning question for everyone. Um, so Netflix has announced they're going to create a new series about the Space Force, starring Steve Carell, John Malkovich. Um, what advice do you have uh, for the makers of that show? So that, it's funny that you say this. And I, I didn't plant this question. This is, but I, I, so about a year ago, I think this started to come out. So about a year and a half ago, I was going through my bank statement, and I see I was getting money taken out for Netflix every month. And I, at the time, really was not a Netflix watcher. I said, well, what am I doing this for? And I canceled it. And within about 35 seconds from three different places around the country, my three children came up, hey, what happened to Netflix? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not watching it. And they said, oh, dad. And so I turned it back on. <laughs> And then about a couple months later, about a year ago, my uh, one daughter calls me and said, Dad, space is really going big. And I said, well, what do you mean it's going big? And they said, uh, well, they're doing a show about space. And Steve Carell is going to play you. I said, well, he's going to have to get a really significant haircut if that's the case. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. And then on Twitter, this is no kidding, there was a Twitter thing going around on who's going to play who. And uh, so then the big joke was, who's going to play Raymond? Well, uh, we're hoping it's going to be Bruce Willis. So that's the, that's the guy. So, uh, that, if, if there was any advice, I'd say get Bruce Willis because that'd be pretty cool. Uh, but I, in all seriousness, though, 
people ask me about this show and it's going to be a comedy and you know well yeah but I, I tell you there's a, a bunch of excitement about space today a bunch of excitement in every sector if you look at if you look at you know what NASA is doing in the civil sector with you know moon to Mars and you, you look at what's going on in the commercial industry and and in uh, you know, with with all the 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 large constellations of satellites, the different launch vehicle providers that are that are uh, uh, being developed, and then you look at what's going on in national security space with a with a U.S. Space Command and 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 hopefully a, a, a space force here. There's a lot of excitement. We have we have more people knocking on our door saying, "How do I become a part of that?" And I remember as I started off in my remarks, I remember talking about um, this dinner series that CSIS hosted a few years ago and one of the things was how do you how do you uh, inspire the next generation of folks about space you know I I remember I was a little kid at West Point New York sitting on my floor in the living room watching man walk on the moon uh, who what's that today well I think there's lots of that today in all segments and to give you an example uh, two years ago I have a thousand cadets that graduated from the Air Force Academy. Only 13 came to space out of 1,000. This last year, there was 35. Now they've stood up a space ops major, and there's more coming. I, I'm getting, I, I made the mistake of, I gave a talk to the 4,000 cadets, 2,000 cadets in the morning or in the evening, first hour, and then they were freshmen, sophomores, and then the next hour was juniors and seniors. And I made the mistake of saying, hey, if I can ever be of any help to you, you're, I'm on the goal. Uh, and I, no kidding, I'm, Emails are coming routinely that says, hey, "Sir, how do I get into space? I'm, I'm, I've been set to go to job whatever, and I want to come to space." I said, "Okay." And in those cases where they reached out, I was able to find a little help and shift them over to the space bench. So uh, that's just one example. But there, there, this is, I think, is a great thing uh, uh, for our nation that that there's this. Uh, excitement about this domain, which I think is going to pay huge dividends uh, for our country going forward. And I, I am really, 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 really privileged uh, to play a part in this. I, I feel very, very lucky. My whole career has been spent uh, in this business, and and to think that we're at the point where we are at today, uh, it's really exciting. And I'm I'm excited uh, because I think. Um, we're going to provide a significant advantage uh, for our nation and, the, and our partners of uh, who we partner with. So, I, Todd, thank you for what you do. Uh, thank you for being a leading voice in this business. Uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here with you today and share some thoughts. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you.